Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining the Hong Kong New Journalism talk. Uh, today's topic is Moral Courage. It's named after Dr. Anthony Feinstein's book. And Dr. Anthony Feinstein is a professor of psychiatry joining us from the University of Toronto. I'll give you a little a rundown of what today's one hour event is gonna be. We're gonna have a 20 minute presentation from Dr. Anthony Feinstein and afterwards we'll have a Q and A session. Uh, we have received some questions from the audience uh, but during the talk, if you want to send your questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and send us your questions there. And during the talk, please remain on mute and switch off your camera. So we'll pass the time to uh, Dr. Feinstein. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation. I'm very pleased to join you from, from Toronto. I'm just going to screen share, so give me a moment. There we are. So I'm going to speak about journalists, moral courage and the pressures and the dangers that journalists can face in their work. And I'd like to start off with this paper that my group published, you'll notice 2002, so this is going back 21 years, and you are looking at the very first publication that explored the psychological health of journalists who cover conflict. And I became interested in this topic after I had a patient in my clinical practice who turned out to be a frontline journalist. She'd been working in Africa, covering a famine in East Africa. She had become very traumatized by her work. And after her return to Canada, she developed a lot of psychological problems. She was referred to my clinic. She did very well with therapy. She was a fascinating woman. She had seen a lot of history. She had been to many different war zones. And I was intrigued by her presentation. And I remember saying to her at the time, you know, you knew you were getting into emotional problems when you were working in East Africa. Why did you not reach out for help? And she told me that I didn't understand her profession, that if she let on that she was psychologically weak, they would stop sending her, her news organization would stop sending her back to do conflict work. And she loved to work and she didn't want to stop doing this. So I thought this was a somewhat punitive attitude of, on the part of a news organization with a lot of resources. And I was intrigued by the topic. So I went into the literature search, what had been written on the subject of conflict and journalists and psychological health. And I could not find a single publication, not one. I remember the year was 2000, 2001. Um, I'm privileged to work at a large university which has the second finest library of all universities in North America. I went to the librarian and said, you know, I cannot find a single publication on the topic of journalist war and psychological well-being. And they said, leave it with us for 24 hours, we'll get back to you. And they phoned me back and said, you're right, there's nothing published on the topic. And this is very unusual in medicine. You know, there's a huge literature on trauma and soldiers, veterans, police people, victims of assault, rape, etc. But nothing had been written on journalists. And so because of that, I wrote a grant application, sent it to the Freedom Forum in Washington, DC, and they funded the very first study looking at psychological well-being in frontline journalists. And in the study that you see up on the screen, I was able to recruit 140 journalists from big organizations like CNN, the BBC, Reuters, Associated Press. And they also had a control group of journalists who had never been to conflict, who stayed home in Canada, and reported on local news. And I compared the two groups with respect to symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and psychological distress. And no surprises, I've found a lot higher levels of post-traumatic stress disorder and depression in the group that had gone off to cover war and conflict. What was striking about these data was that the group who were traumatized were not more likely to have received any kind of psychological help for their difficulties. So this was being missed. News, or, news organizations were not looking after the psychological well-being of the journalists. This particular publication that you see in the American Journal of Psychiatry got a lot of press. It was featured in the New York Times and almost overnight on the basis of a single study, I became this instant expert on the topic of journalists and war and trauma. So what happened after this was that news organizations started to approach me to ask me questions about their staff. When the war started in Iraq in 2003, 
I was asked to do a study to see, was it good for journalists to be attached to military units? Would, we, would, they, would it help them in terms of their psychological well-being, or was it dangerous? And we did a study and showed it really didn't matter whether journalists were part of the, the military units or not, because war still remained dangerous. You weren't getting protected by the soldiers around you. Soon after that, I was approached by UNESCO to do a study in Mexico. They were worried about journalists covering the drug stories in that country, and journalists were being targeted by the drug cartels, and UNESCO was worried about their psychological well being. So we did a study funded by UNESCO. And what my group showed was that the cartels knew how to silence journalists. They did it by going after their families, by going after their parents, their children, their grandparents. That was the way they were getting to silence journalists. And so bit by bit over the years, I put together a very large database of journalists doing this kind of work. About five or six years back, I was approached by the International News Safety Institute to ask if I could do a study looking at the migration crisis in Europe. And you will know that in 2017, 18, there was this huge wage of migration across Europe, largely from Africa, but from wars in the Middle East. And journalists were covering this, of course. And the news organizations wanted to know how was this affecting their emotional health. Well, on the one hand, we showed some good news that these journalists were not traumatized by post-traumatic stress disorder or depression, but they had something called moral injury. And what is moral injury? Well, this is defined as the injury done to a person's conscience or moral compass when that person perpetrates, witnesses, or fails to prevent acts that transgress their own moral and ethical codes and values. So just stay with this definition for a moment. This is something that can come about from perpetrating or witnessing things or from failing to prevent acts. So we speak about acts of commission, things that you might do that are morally compromising or acts of omission. You see things that are morally compromising, but you don't do anything, you keep quiet. And for journalists, this can be a real challenge because you're asked to cover the news, you're asked to be a witness to what's going on in society, you see things, you report them. If you fail to report them for whatever reason, you may feel that you're compromising yourself morally because of these acts of omission, and that can lead to moral injury. And the emotions, the cardinal emotions associated with moral injury are shame and guilt and anger. These are very uncomfortable emotions. Now, one of the challenges that we had when dealing with this particular topic is that there was no validated self-report rating scale for moral injury in journalists. There wasn't one. So we had to borrow scales that had been developed by the military. Now, for example, the American military knew about moral injury and they recognized that it was a big problem in their soldiers coming home from the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. You know, young soldiers had been sent to Iraq in 2003. They were given a mission, which was we're going to spread democracy in the Middle East, and it didn't turn out that way. You know, a country ended up getting destroyed, and some of the soldiers coming back felt morally um, compromised by what had happened. And they were really suffering from moral injury, the feelings of guilt and shame and anger. So the military, understanding that this was a problem, had developed self report rating scales for soldiers to detect moral injury, but there was nothing for journalists. And so my group set about trying to develop a particular rating scale for journalists. It was a two-stage process. We met with a number of journalists, roundtable discussions. We collected a lot of the data that they had to say. We then did exploratory factor analysis and confirmatory factor analysis of the data that we collected. And these were the kind of morally injurious events that the journalists were telling us. They said it was distressing to witness subjects who behaved in ways that they considered morally wrong. They were upset to learn of colleagues who acted in ways they considered morally wrong. Look at number three, my failure to respond to editors who acted in ways that I considered morally wrong. It distressed me to learn about what might considered morally compromised decisions, etc. You can work your way down what's a lengthy list of what journalists were telling us troubled them about their profession. A morally compromised decision of editors upset me. I was troubled by the changing landscape of online journalism. Very important that, and you know, the morally egregious behavior that takes place online when journalists are getting targeted and harassed online for doing their work. 
And because of this, there were consequences. Jonas was saying, my work has lost some of its meaning and value. I sabotaged my relationships. I avoided online interactions. Life was losing its meaning and purpose. I felt alienated from my profession. I found it difficult to establish boundaries between work and personal life. I avoided social interactions. Online responses to my work changed my perspective on a story. I was less trusting of others. I felt demoralized. I used alcohol and illicit substances to make me feel better. I doubted my religious convictions and I doubted my spirituality. So you can see there are some real world consequences of moral injury. My behaviors were self-defeating. I failed to take care of myself. I questioned the validity of my opinions. I doubted my judgment. I felt less empathic for my subjects, for myself. I behaved aggressively. These were all the kinds of responses that we got back from a large sample of journalists who were telling us how they felt in response to what was moral injury. So I put up this um, picture over here, taken by the great war photographer, Don McCullen. And this is a very famous photograph that many of you I'm sure will have seen. It's an American soldier during the Vietnam War. And Don McCullen, whom I've interviewed, speaks passionately about how he feels he has compromised himself by taking photographs of people in great distress. He feels guilty that is intruded into the lives of people with his camera and filmed them in their darkest moments. And he feels that he has profited and lived off this. He's been given many awards. He's been knighted. He's now known as Sir Don McCullen. And he feels guilty that he's gathered all this praise, all this fame, all this award because his work is based on the suffering of other people. And if you bring that back to moral injury, what is that? He feels that he has perpetrated an act that transgresses his moral compass. And what's that act? He took his camera into the lives of people who had lost everything, victims of war, victims of trauma. He photographed them for him. This was a morally egregious act. And when he speaks about it, when he writes about it, you can see that he has moral injury. Now, from my perspective, this is misplaced guilt. He doesn't have to feel this way. His job as a journalist is to tell the story. His job is to take the photograph. How can you do this? How can you tell the story? How can you give voice to the dispossessed or the victims of war if you don't take a photograph, if you don't tell a story? So what Don McCullen finds himself in it is this trap, this cognitive distortion. He believes he's done something wrong. In reality, what he's done is very great journalism. But you can see how journalists can fall into the trap of moral injury through these mistaken beliefs what we call cognitive distortions. So to help journalists with this, we've developed the Toronto Moral Injury Scale for Journalists. We validated it. We recently public, pub, um, published it. It's out there in the public domain. People can use it freely. And it's a very simple scale. All our data were analyzed exhaustively, and we came up with nine questions that make up the Moral Injury Scale. I was troubled by my interaction with online audiences. My failure to respond to editors who acted in ways I considered morally wrong troubled me. I was troubled by the culture of my news organizations which might be considered morally compromised at times. It unsettled me when I learned about subjects who acted in ways that are considered morally wrong. The morally compromised decisions of editors upset me. In my work as a journalist, I regretted acting in ways I considered morally wrong. I was troubled by online morally compromised responses to my work. I regretted not speaking out about what I saw as morally compromised the culture of my news organization. And I felt upset when I witnessed colleagues behaving in ways that I considered morally wrong. And journalists can rate these scales on a very simple Likert scale over here. None, minimal, moderate, quite a lot. And there's one more over here, just being obscured by the thing, severe. So zero, one, two, three, four, and you can add up a total score for moral injury. And the higher the score, the more significant the symptoms are of moral injury. So we are now using this particular scale to quantify the symptoms of moral injury. And I'll give you an example by way of conclusion. I was recently asked to do a study looking at online harassment of journalists. 
You know this, this is a huge problem. Journalists are getting harassed by the public. They're getting harassed by Twitter, email. They're getting phone calls. People are even visiting news organizations. They're following journalists in the street. There is a lot of abuse directed at journalists. So we did a study to quantify this for a particular news organization and to see what might be factors that were promoting it, factors that might be helping journalists deal with it. So we collected all the data on harassment. We collected the data on depression, psychological distress, post-traumatic stress disorder, but we also gave the journalists the Toronto Moral Injury Scale. And we found something really interesting, that journalists who felt that they were not being protected by the news organization endorsed many more symptoms of moral injury. They had a much higher score on the Toronto Moral Injury Scale. So there was an inverse relationship. The less support that you were getting from your news organization on these difficult questions of harassment, the higher your sense of moral injury. And so there's a message in this, that news organizations have a moral duty to help journalists. If news organizations are asking journalists to do difficult work, covering war zones, covering conflict, covering revolutions, protests, the kind of work that can leave a journalist psychologically traumatized, they have a moral responsibility to help the journalist if this condition arises. I don't think it's happening well enough. I think many organizations are neglecting the welfare of the journalists. I think they take the physical safety of journalists much more seriously than they take the psychological well-being of journalists. And this is a false dichotomy. You should not distinguish between physical safety and psychological safety. The two are linked. Because we know this, that if a journalist develops psychological problems, whether it's PTSD, maybe moral injury, depression, etc., these psychological difficulties can bring down a journalist very hard. It can be just as disabling as a physical injury or a physical wound. And so that's my message to you. You know, this is you have the next generation of journalists, you're going out there, you're called on to cover difficult stories, etc. You need to be aware of the psychological consequences of the work that you do. Because if you're aware of it, you're going to be in a better position to help yourself and to get your news organization to help you should these difficulties arise. And I like to leave my book, my short talk, on an optimistic note. They are effective therapies for post-traumatic stress disorder good psychological therapies. Depression can be well treated. Moral injury, which is not a mental illness, important to say that, moral injury, which is not a mental illness, can also respond well to therapy. You can help journalists with all these emotional difficulties. And it's imperative that this happens, because as I say, when you leave emotional difficulties untreated, they generally don't go away. They tend to linger, they fester, and they can bring someone down. Good journalism depends on healthy journalists. And that applies to both your physical well-being and your psychological well-being. So I think I've used up my, my 20 minutes. Um, I do welcome questions and I welcome having a discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Anthony Feinstein. Um, so we will start the Q&A right now and I'll get us going through some questions submitted by the attendees. I encourage all uh, of you who are listening uh, to type your questions in the Q&A and it's not necessary, but feel free to like share your name and your affiliation to Hong Kong New Journalism and Hong Kong U. Um, so Dr. Feinstein, my first yeah. question is about the uh, newsroom policies, because you were saying there are things that newsrooms can do. And um, so I am actually doing a PhD degree. I am applying uh, using the Toronto Moral Injury Scale for journalists to uh, help journalists with more injuries and to see if uh, psychological treatments or counseling can help them with those. And one of the things that I found one of those uh, morally injurious events that occur to journalists is when they go in teams to conflict zones and whatnot, and they have different opinions than their teammates, such as right. one believes you have to put down the camera and help those who are in danger. One believes you should do yes. holding the camera. And um, so a discussion with the journalist uh, gives us the insights that maybe uh, more injuries can be prevented by having a discussion before going to on a trip together, things like that, uh, that we are trying to find out more and more what newsrooms can do and what can prevent more injuries. Do you have any insights on what other things newsrooms? I do. 
Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, that, that, that's a great point because what you just spoke about now is exactly one of the difficulties we identified in journalists covering the refugee crisis in Europe. What was happening was as journalists were being sent in large numbers to cover these refugees arriving in boats on the shores of Greece or Italy, et cetera, often the journalists would be a first responder. They would be there before anybody else. And then what do you do? If you see a boat offshore and people can't swim and they're drowning, do you take pictures or do you go in and try and help the person? You have this moral dilemma. Now you would say you put your humanity first, you put your camera down and you go and try and save a life. But then once you're there, who do you save? How many people do you save? You're not schooled in doing first aid. You're not schooled in resuscitating people. You are not a first responder. You're not a medical person. You're not part of a, you know, an NGO in which people have been trained to help others in distress. You're journalists. So how far does that help go? You know, journalists were telling us, you know, they would be approached by, by refugees asking for money. What do you do when someone's got no money and they can't buy food? Do you give them money? How much money do you give? Do you give to one person, but not the other? How do you make these decisions? And so they were being called on all the time to make these decisions um, that were very tough to make. And this was happening while the news organizations back home, you know, in London or New York, were saying to them, why aren't you getting the story? You're not going, you know, we have not sent you there to act as an NGO, to act as a first responder. You're there to act as a journalist. You've got to get the story. If you don't get the photograph, maybe the next person gets it and they get the scoop and they beat us to the photograph. And so these kinds of morally tough decisions were deeply distressing to them. Your point, I think, is excellent. You need to have a discussion about this before you go into the field. So when you go into the field, you have the discussion amongst yourselves. What do we do when you come across a situation like this? How are we expected to respond? Yes, you can say you've got to put your humanity first and you've got to help, but how much help do you give? Where does that help end? Who do we help, etc.? Because remember this, no good deed goes unpunished. There's a saying like that in English, you know? The road to damnation is paved with good intentions. You want to help, but then you unleash a whole lot of consequences that are hard for you to control. For example, one journalist gave out his email address to some refugees because he was moved by what he was seeing. He said, you know, he has my email address, maybe I can help you. Well, the refugees passed around the email address to thousands of refugees. Suddenly this man's inbox is filled with hundreds of, journal of refugees, like, help me, help me, help me. You know, he meant to do well, but now he's got a situation that's completely unmanageable. So, he doesn't respond, he feels bad, he doesn't respond. He's act of omission, he feels guilty, he feels ashamed because he's not responding. But how do you respond to hundreds of people asking you for food, for money, for work, etc.? So these are difficult decisions and having a discussion about them beforehand, having a plan of action beforehand potentially prevents you getting into a situation that you feel morally compromises you. So it's a great point. So to follow up on that, um, you mentioned more injuries. You describe it as a cognitive dissonance. Um, can you tell us more about how you know counselors or therapists or psychiatrists can do to uh, you know with journalists who have more injuries? What can be help? Uh, what can help them? And what approaches, psychological you know counseling approaches, have been proven uh, effective? Can you share? Yeah. Thanks. So really what you want to try and correct as part of your therapy, this cognitive distortion, these false cognitive beliefs. So, you know, we can come back to the photographer who feels bad and guilty because he's getting awards for his photography and he feels that I'm profiteering off the suffering of other people. And this is quite a common thing in my clinical work. A journalist will approach me and say, you know, last week I was at this event it was a lovely event. It was in a hotel ballroom. Everybody was well dressed. It was, you know, it was, a, it was a lovely evening. I was given this wonderful award. People stood up and clapped. Um, but I feel terrible. I feel terrible because I got this award because of other people's suffering. And he's got guilt and he feels ashamed. And that really is moral injury. But within that belief system is a distortion because he has lost touch 
of why is he there as a journalist. He is there to bear witness. Bearing witness is extremely important. Bearing witness allows you to record contemporary history. It gives the voice to people who might have lost their voice. It tells a story that the world needs to hear about because otherwise no one would know about it. The people who are going through suffering often want their story told. They don't want it to be suppressed. They want the world to know what's going on. And so the person is there to work as a journalist to convey that. The only way that he can do it is to take his photographs. How else is he going to do it? If he was a writer, how else can you convey the news if you don't write about it? So you have to do it. This is the kind of work that you do. You're skilled to do it. You do it well. This is your craft. You know, journalists are contemporary historians. You are keeping civil society informed of what's going on. It's a very important role. But to do that, you've got to take the photograph. You've got to tell the story. And so you work with the journalist in his therapy saying, let's go back to discuss why did you become a journalist? What is the role of a journalist in society? How do you fulfill that role, et cetera, et cetera. And basically you start showing the person that the guilt is misplaced, that the shame is misplaced. It's understandable on one level, but it's misplaced. It's a mistake, it's a distortion. And the moment the individual starts grasping that construct, then the emotions start improving. You know, so I've simplified it to a degree, but that's the principles of what you're trying to do. Right. But what if they are feeling like uh, guilt and shame or anger, especially anger, uh, when they are witnessing that their colleagues, say their editors or people in the war zones doing something that are morally wrong. So it's not their own behavior that they are mad about, but it's other people's. So if they're yes. angry about some wrongdoings, can we say this is cognitive dissonance or like how do no, you no. no, and that's understandable as well. Absolutely. So you can see from the moral injury scale that you can be distressed by other people's behavior. And that's very common. I mean, we certainly, I'll give you, a, I'll give you an example that I think you'll be able to readily recognize, you know, during the height of the pandemic crisis, when we would be encouraged to use masks to keep us safe. You know, there would be members of society in Canada who did not want to wear masks, you know? And, you know, people go along to supermarkets and they find someone not wearing a mask and there'd be a fight. So you put on your mask. No, I'm not going to wear my mask because it's an infringement of my civil rights. You've got behavior like that, which, you know, we're compromising the safety of other people. And that was a morally egregious behavior, you know, making people upset. Um, journalists will come across this all the time in their work. But you have to realize that you can't control many things. You can't control how other people behave. You can't control huge forces in society that shift way beyond a single journalist. And you have to recognize that. You have to recognize the things you can control and the things that you can't control. The things you can control is your behavior, your responses, the way you lead your life, your own moral compass, the way you behave towards other people, et cetera, et cetera. But you can't control other people. You can't control governments, you can't control big powerful forces that are out there. You can report on them, but you can't control them. And your hope is that through your work as a journalist, perhaps you'll be able to shift opinion so that the morally egregious behavior that you see starts changing. That's the hope, isn't it? That when you go along and report on a difficult story, that when people find out about it and you're informing civil society what's going on, that you can bring about change. That's the hope, that you bring about change. And if that change is in a positive direction, wonderful, then you, you know, you've really achieved something quite remarkable as a journalist. But you also have to recognize that sometimes you can't bring about the change, that you can't change people, you can't change governments, you can't change organizations, but that doesn't mean you stop doing your work. Because if you do, you're becoming defeated by what is potentially your own moral injury. So that's the trap for you. In my profession, as a physician, during the height of the pandemic, Doctors were being asked to make very tough moral decisions. Who do we resuscitate? Who do we try and save? Who can't we save? When someone is dying, you can't let the family into the room because there's the COVID restrictions. People were dying alone during the pandemic because it was mandated that family couldn't come into the room because they would pass on the infection. And doctors had to enforce that. There was a really difficult decision from a moral perspective. And they felt terrible, they felt guilt and felt shame about it. 
But once again, you have to frame it in the context of the greater good, which is that what you're doing over here is in a sense behaving in a way that's protective for more people. It's tough and it's hard, but you're saving more people by doing this. And so those kind of distortions creep into this work all the time. And journalists, because you're on the front lines of so many things, are going to be confronting decisions like this all the time. That brings us to the term uh, and the title of your book, Moral Courage, right? Uh, do you want to say something? I see we have a question from the audience. What advice would you give to a young audience who may find themselves reporting from combat zones? Uh, so would you say to them, you just apply moral courage or do you have, you know, advice? Uh, you know, um, I never tell a journalist what to do in terms of their work. It's not my role as a psychiatrist. But what I can say is this, this is what I've learned from 23 years of doing this research. You want to be knowledgeable about safety, about physical safety, but about mental health safety as well. You know, news organizations generally focus on keeping a person physically safe. They give you a flak jacket, they give you a helmet, but that's where the safety stops. They don't tell you about psychological safety. You need to be educated about what might happen psychologically when I report on war, revolution, riots, whatever, natural disasters, tsunamis. Those kind of events can have a profound effect on journalists because you see people die. You see terrible things happen and you are witness to it. And that stress is so severe, it can trigger things like post-traumatic stress disorder or depression or substance abuse or moral injury. So you need to be aware of what are these conditions, because if you're aware of what they are, you're going to be in a better place to recognize the difficulties when they crop up. Now, I don't want your class to be alarmed because my research shows that the majority of journalists are fine. The majority of journalists will never develop PTSD or depression or moral injury. But the minority who do, it's a substantial minority. So for example, journalists who cover war, war reporters, who go back year after year after year to covering war, their rates of post-traumatic stress disorder are as high as frontline soldiers. And that's not surprising because they have spent 10, 15 years in the world's most dangerous places. And if that's going to be your work environment, if you choose to work in war zones, then potentially you are at risk for post-traumatic stress disorder. And so it's important that you know what these conditions are, because if you recognize them, you will seek treatment for them. And like anything in medicine, the earlier you get the treatment, the better the outcome. You know? If you've got an infection, you don't wait to get full-blown pneumonia before you start taking your antibiotics. No, of course not. You intervene early and you get a better outcome. It's the same with emotional distress. You don't wait until it's so severe and everything's fallen apart before you get help. You go early. When you start seeing the first signs, you reach out early and you get assistance. And that's why it's so important that news organizations recognize this and provide that kind of confidential help to journalists, because if they don't, where are you going to get it? And so having a discussion with you is really important because you know, your class is getting educated on this important topic, but news organizations need to hear it as well. Editors, news managers need to hear it because they're the ones who set the tone for the news organization. And they have a moral duty to provide this help to you. Mm -hmm. The news organization says, you have to go out there and cover this riot. You've got to go there and cover this war zone. And they are sending you into harm's way. They have a moral duty to provide help to you should you need it. Right. And um, so I, in my literature review, I understand that sometimes journalists or like uh, military veterans that are diagnosed with uh, PTSD only, but only later uh, they find out they also have more injuries. And if <laughs> those are not identified earlier, then the treatment outcome wouldn't be like optimal because the part yes. of injuries uh, is untreated. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions for journalists and, you know, going through emotional challenges? I do. Conversation with their counselors or like a therapist or like you said, a, you know, uh, just general doctor, what, what should they, what that conversation should be like? How, how can they share that? Right. So, so, in, so in Canada, I don't know, I'm sure it's probably the same in Hong Kong, you know, once a year, you should go and see your general practitioner, your GP for a checkup. You know? Your blood pressure, you check your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your cholesterol, things like that. Good common sense. 
you see your family doctor once a year for a checkup. In Canada, people even take their cars into the garage once a year for a checkup, you know, to get the oil changed, the brakes checked, etc. So why not see a psychologist once a year for a very quick mental health check? Very simple. You make an appointment, you go in, and you just check on your emotional health. How am I doing? You know, I can do something like that very quickly with a journalist. You ask a couple of questions, you get a sense of how they're doing emotionally. If there's a problem, you can explore it in greater detail. But having a quick emotional checkup once a year, I think is a really good idea. You know, people don't think twice about going to see their family doctor once a year for their blood pressure, their sugar, their cholesterol, whatever. Why make a distinction between that and psychological difficulty? There is this false dichotomy in medicine. We have physical illness here and we have psychological illness here and somehow they're not linked. That's nonsense. It's exactly the same thing. It's all illness. It's all the same difficulty. It's just different symptoms, but it's part of the stigma of mental health that people are reluctant to do it. it might be a shame. They're uncomfortable about it. It's a difficult thing to discuss. And so they don't do it. They avoid it. And avoidance is a really bad coping strategy. It's the worst coping strategy. You don't want to avoid things. And so, you know, once a year, you go along, you see your psychologist say, hey, you know, my work's been difficult. It's been stressful. It's been a lot of online harassment. There's been a lot of difficult stories to recover. You know, we've, 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 we've been speaking here about war and revolution, but domestic news can be tough as well. You know, murders, crime scenes, terrible road traffic accidents, domestic violence. These things can be very hard stories to cover. You can be traumatized by them. You can be upset by them. And so, you know, you go along and see your mental health therapist and say, hey, I've come for my yearly checkup. It's been a tough year. I've done this. I've done that. How am I doing? And your therapist can ask a few simple questions to give you a very quick answer. Mm -hmm. I would do it. Yeah, I just want to share a quote that I heard from uh, in the talk uh, by Mind HK, uh, Mind Hong Kong, which is a non-governmental uh, organization here in Hong Kong. Um, so the speaker was saying mental health is actually a spectrum. Everyone has mental health. You can have good mental health or you just like somewhere along the spectrum. So um, that is their response toward uh, mental health stigma. There is another question from the audience. What are the differences between the psychological effects inflicted upon journalists and that of other stakeholders, such as refugees, humanitarian workers, et cetera? Are there any differences? Um, there are going to be differences. I mean, you know, refugees, for example, have lost everything. You know, they have very little resources, very little power. They've, they've lost their homes. They might have lost their family. They have no financial resources. You know, these are desperate people, right? And then they are very vulnerable because of that. They can be preyed upon. They can be traumatized. They're very vulnerable because of that. Journalists, thankfully, don't have that kind of vulnerability. You've got a profession. You might not be that well paid, but you've got a bit of money. You know, you're 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 in a better situation socially. Um, but you know, the data from a number of studies show that journalists are increasingly targeted um, in many different ways, and the whole notion now of online harassment has become a very profound issue for journalists. It's a big worry the way journalists are being harassed through Twitter email, Instagram, et cetera. Um, social media has unleashed a lot of negative forces. It gives um, people a negative ability to affect others through harassment. And journalists, because of the nature of what you do, because you're in the public domain, because you have a high profile, are often the victims of that kind of work. So even in a civil society like Canada, which is at peace, in which you know there's a very strong rule of law and there's a good quality of life and there's not a whole lot of crime, even in a country like Canada, there is tremendous online harassment of journalists. Um, and it's something that is almost impossible to control. It's one of those variables you can't control. How do you stop someone harassing you via Twitter or Instagram? The only way to do it is not to use Twitter, not to use Instagram, but then you're giving up a way of communicating with many of your readers, etc. So you've got this really tough dilemma. So those are the kind of pressures that journalists are facing now in a country like Canada. Um, countries that are going through much more difficult situations like the Ukraine. I mean, journalists are in grave physical danger in the Ukraine. Um, 
journalists who covered the earthquake in Turkey recently, you know, saw horrendous sites, you know, within a couple of days, what, over 40,000 people dead and journalists are witness to that and the survivors and the grief and they have to report on all that. These are really tough stories. So what journalists are experiencing is gonna be qualitatively different from what a refugee experiences, but it can still be very tough. Well, we have another question. How can universities worldwide help cultivate this culture of young journalists taking control of their own mental health, uh, being prioritized by news organizations or freelancing? That, that's a great question. And the answer is through education. There is no substitute for education. Education, education, education. The fact that we're doing this session now is exactly what needs to be done. So that you educate yourself about what is the topic, what is post-traumatic stress disorder? What does it entail? What are the symptoms of PTSD? I mean, we've all heard of those four letters, PTSD, but what does it mean? I'll define it for you. This is a condition that can arise in response to an overwhelming stress. And you get symptoms of re-experiencing, like flashbacks and nightmares, unwanted thoughts. You get the avoidant behavior. You get the arousal of the autonomic system, like irritability, difficulty concentrating, can't fall asleep, startle response and then the negative beliefs that creep in, you anticipate future misfortune. You need to educate about, get, educate yourself about these things. There is no substitute for education. And so schools of journalism, colleges, universities need to bring in as part of the curriculum for journalism students, this very topic. We are now going to have a couple of lectures on the psychological challenges of working as a journalist. So just as you're taught to do certain things in terms of your reporting, be educated about this topic. So we have one more. Uh, how do journalists stay objective when they are psychologically affected by incidents? Yeah, that's a, that, there it is. First of all, you know you can argue about objectivity in journalism even if you're not traumatized. So that that's a really interesting question. But absolutely, once you are affected emotionally, your perspective on the world changes. I mean, I didn't bring along a data set. To share with you, but I we, we did a study. We went into the final year journalism class at a university in Canada, and we said, "Okay, we're going to divide the class into two. One set of students is going to look at image war and conflict. The other set in a different classroom will look at neutral images, things like scenes of nature, mountains, rivers, streams, etc." At the end of it, we're going to bring you all together in the same room and we're going to show you a look at a series of facial expressions. It's what we call an atlas of facial affect in which you show happiness, sadness, disgust and anger, but it's divided up into different degrees of severity, like six degrees of happiness, six degrees of sadness, so very, very subtle to profound. Okay? And we said we want you to rate the emotion and give it a severity rating. And what we found was that the group that looked at the scenes of war and revolution, very hard images to look at, were much more finely attuned to facial expressions of sadness. Whereas the group that looked at the neutral images were more finely attuned to images of happiness. When we showed pictures of disgust and fear, the group that looked at the images of war mistook disgust for fear. I mean, I can go on and on about this, but basically what we were able to show within one hour of showing people photographs, we changed temporarily the way they saw facial expression. So extrapolate from that. If you're not traumatized and you're emotionally distressed and you feel this way all the time, you will see the world fundamentally differently from how you did before you were traumatized. We know that. And that's one of the problems over here. You don't just lose your objectivity as much as you can, but your judgment starts suffering. Your behavior starts changing. You know, I remember getting consults when the war was going on in Iraq and Afghanistan in which there would be a journalist in a very small bureau who had become traumatized. And you know, he was working with five or six colleagues. That traumatized journalist compromised the safety of everyone because of their trauma. The judgment was off. They were making mistakes. They made the wrong call because it was being influenced by their emotional distress. And that's a huge problem. 
So you don't just suffer personally, you can get other people to suffer as well. If you've got a traumatized journalist in the newsroom, that journalist can infect the newsroom with their distress, with their trauma. We see this all the time. And so this is not just important for the individual, it's important for the other people who work with the individual. And it's important for the journalist's family because that journalist brings their trauma and upset home with them at the end of the day. So compelling reasons why you want to deal with this. So um, I understand that you were saying also the question was about being objective and you said like journalists should go to like maybe year, yearly check up with a psychologist or a counselor. Are there any other things that journalists can do for instance in the moment yeah. when they feel like they, they are suffering from this right. psychological effect. Uh, I understand maybe there is a way some people would say compartmentalize, just right. deal with emotions later after you have done your work. Some say you can just look at calming images and you can find mm -hmm. something to cope with that emotions first. And then when you're calm, you go on with your work. Right. Do you have any tips for our listeners right now? I do, yes. So. Um, you know, given that the nature of the work that you do can often be very difficult, emotionally tough, it becomes really important for you to be able to step back from what you do and engage in things that are not stressful. I mean, I've learned this about journalists, that you can get caught up in a big story, very difficult content, and it can take over your life. That you're doing it for 16, 17 hours a day, day after day after day, etc. You kind of so um, invested in the story, everything else seems to stop. I understand that, it can be very intense. But you need to realize that you can't sustain something like that. You need your downtime. We come back to what I said earlier, there are gonna be events in your life that you can control and things that you can't control. You can't control the flow of news. You can't control um, the trauma that's out there. You can't control big things that determine how society functions. But what you can control is how you respond. How am I going to do it? You know, I'm going to work hard, but I'm going to have time away from work. And that's absolutely essential because time away from work will allow you to sleep and get proper rest. If you are exhausted, you will not process trauma properly you'll be compromised in how you process these things. You've got to attend to your sleep. You've got to attend to your nutrition. I'll give you a really powerful anecdote. After the terrorist attacks of 9-11, I was invited to New York to spend time with news organizations. And what I saw was journalists working so hard that they weren't eating properly. You know, they were ordering some hurried fast food, sitting at their desk, you know, munching it down, just working you know, for lunch. For the, well, you can't keep doing that day after day after day. You've got to pay attention to your nutrition. You've got to be able to step away and look after yourself physically. What do you like doing that gives you pleasure outside of work? Is it exercise, going for a run? Is it listening to music? Is it playing music? Is it seeing friends? Is it socializing? You've got to build those activities into your lifestyle. Remember this, that one of the most powerful predictors of good mental health is a good relationship. Good relationships are important. They sustain you emotionally, they help you emotionally. How do you get a good relationship? Well, you've got to give time to relationships. You can't ignore your relationship and think it's just going to be fine. You've got to devote time to your partner, to your spouse, to your wife, to your husband, to your children, to your parents, because it's good for you and it's good for them and it's good for your emotional health. So when you say, what can you do? Well, there are many things in your life that you can control, your sleep, how you eat, your leisure pursuits, looking after your relationships, you know, turning off your cell phone when you go to bed at night so you don't get woken up, those kind of things. You've got to learn to look after yourself. Great tip. Um, there is one more question here is that you mentioned journalists being hesitant to ask for help. In your research, why do you think journalists have struggled with talking about difficult situations? Right. Many reasons. I mean, that, that's, that you know, was for me the, the biggest thing that got me into doing this research. I had this, this, this celebrated war journalist in Canada who knew she was in trouble and never asked for help. And she only had to get help when she broke down. 
And she said to me, you don't understand this profession, that if I'd asked for help, I would never get sent out into the field again. You know, that's very punitive. I think things have changed now. I mean, that, that was 22 years ago. But there's a fear on the part of journalists that if they tell the news organization I'm depressed or I'm traumatized or I can't do this, that somehow they won't get sent out in the field again. They'll be viewed as damaged. And that's a problem. You're also having the stigma of mental illness that people feel uncomfortable about talking about, I feel depressed, I feel anxious. So there's that stigma. Um, and I'll give you an example. You know, um, journalists say to me, what right do I have to complain when the people who I report on have it so much worse? How can I complain about me feeling bad when, you know, I've just come back from the Ukraine where I've seen cities destroyed, where I've seen, you know, people lose children, where I've seen people lose everything. How can I complain? People have it much worse. And my answer is, that's another cognitive trap. There is no, you know, there is no equivalency. What you're feeling cannot be equated to what's going on in a war zone, Turkey with an earthquake, Ukraine with war. But here's an example. If you break a leg and you go into the emergency room and the person lying in the bed next to you has broken both legs, you hop out of bed and leave the hospital saying, hold on, hey, that person's difficulties are much worse than mine. Of course not. You wait to get your broken leg repaired. So just because your psychological difficulties are not of the magnitude that people experience in war zones or revolutions or riots, that doesn't mean you're not suffering. That doesn't mean you don't have significant emotional distress. You have to be very careful of this trap. It isn't an equivalency, but that doesn't negate your own suffering. And so that's one of the reasons why journalists don't want to reach out for help. They feel guilty about doing it because they say to me, other people have it much worse. My response is, it's a cognitive trap. And if you want to be a good journalist, you've got to have healthy emotions. Because otherwise, as one of your questioners said, how can you be objective? How can you manage the story if you are battling your own emotional problems? So you can see how all these pieces come together. So uh, we have another question. Uh, what are the future research direction you're working on? Is there any related topic you think is suitable for Hong Kong, for the situation in Hong Kong? Well, you know, um, you don't need me to tell you that at times it can be very stressful to report on the news. And so um, what is the emotional health of journalists in Hong Kong? I mean, that would be interesting, right? Because when I look at my research over the years, you know, we did our first study, which were on Western journalists going into war zones. But then UNESCO came and said, well, hold on a sec. You know, what about Mexican journalists covering the drug wars? So we did that study. But then I got another commission after that, which was, what about journalists in Africa? You know, all your work is centered on Western countries. Why not an African country? So we went to Kenya and we did a study in Kenya looking at journalists who were subject to severe election violence. And there was a terrorist attack in Kenya, the Al-Shabaab terror organization had packed a mall in Nairobi and journalists were traumatized by that. So we did a study of Kenyan journalists. And then after that, we did a study of Israeli journalists. And then we did a study of journalists covering the war in Syria, the civil war in Syria. And, you know, another one in Afghanistan. So we've done all these studies in different parts of the world. So, you know, you may say to yourself, well, what's the situation like for journalists in Hong Kong? Because that would be an interesting study in which you'd get a sense of how are my colleagues doing on this important question. And then, you know, once you have some data, you could go to news organizations and say, these are our data. How can we address what's going on? Because data make people change. People can't argue with data. I'm a real data-driven person. I like data. Data tell a story and data can bring about change. Mm. So I think that's, you know, that's, that, that's a local story that you could do. In terms of my future work, you know, we're writing up this harassment study, which I think is really important. I mean, harassment is a huge issue now in terms of the way journalists are being treated. But the other thing you've touched on is moral courage. So I have a book coming out in October on moral courage in which I looked at journalists working in countries that have a difficult record of press freedom. Russia, Myanmar, Bangladesh, Azerbaijan, India, Turkey, countries in which journalists are suffering because of lack of press freedom. And I've interviewed journalists to find out why do they keep doing this work, even though they know the environment in which they work can be very difficult for them. And it comes back to this whole notion, well, it's moral courage. And what is moral courage? 
what gives people moral courage, which I think is a fascinating thing because to me, this question goes to the very heart of civil society. It's such an important question. You know, your profession keeps everyone informed. Journalists have such a powerful role to play. You bring the news to people like myself. You tell us what's going on. How do I know what's going on in the Ukraine? Because of journalists. How do I know what's going on? There's a terrible earthquake in, in Turkey because of journalists. Who tells me about what's going on in Hong Kong with protests because of journalists, et cetera. So, you know, the role that you perform is so important in terms of civil society. And that's what intrigues me now. So that's where my research is at. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, so we have come to the end close of this session of the talk, but uh, in the end, I'd like to share just a little bit more uh, on my research findings so far, I realized that journalists have a lot of strengths to rely on. They are curious and they have this passion to pursue justice. And very often when I ask them uh, if they are curious about you know, what the moral values that they have, they want to hold dear to them, even though the outside situations do not seem to you know, align with what they hold dear. Um, so, those are the interesting conversations that one can have with one's uh, counselor or therapist. Just toward the very end, uh, Dr. Feinstein, I want to ask you, are there any other things you want to share with the audience but you didn't have time to talk about, <laughs> you know? Well, um, we could do that for the next four or five hours. <laughs> there are so many interesting topics. You know, I could share so many bits of insight from the various studies that we've done because each study shows us something different. You know, we learn something new every time. And what I like doing with my studies is that when they're finished, we give the data back to the journalists. We say, these are your data. Use the data. Use the data to bring about change. You know, I started this work 23 years back when journalists were not getting any help, nothing. And the study, the one study, the study that I showed you, the American Journal of Psychiatry, changed things. Suddenly it was reported on the New York Times. Suddenly, the New York Times were approaching me saying, we like this research, you know, tell us about what we should be doing. After 9-11, I was invited to New York to come down and speak to people based on the study that the data starts changing how people think. You know, CNN started changing because of these studies saying, hold on, this is really important. We think psychological well-being is really important. So data get people to think, it can change things. If you've got good data, it can make a real difference. You can educate people. Thank you so much. So on that, we just finished the whole talk uh, at 11 shop. Thank you so much. It's late in Canada. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Feinstein. My pleasure. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank and good luck to you all. Thank you so much.